Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Swords. I'm a pediatric urologist at uh, Rady Children's and University of California, San Diego. I'm going to talk today about the surgical management of vesicoureteral reflux. Um, first, thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in. Um, this is an amazing uh, collective of uh, video didactics um, and a really great resource, and um, I appreciate the uh, chance to participate. I have no disclosures, uh, except for that. I did take that picture that you see of the giraffe in Chobe National Park um, when I was in Botswana several years ago. If you ever had the opportunity to go to Botswana, I suggest it. It's a beautiful country and a beautiful place. And Chobe has um, over 100,000 elephants, which is pretty spectacular. So the outline of the talk, um, we're going to do an overview of vesicoureteral reflux. We're going to talk about the history, history of surgical repair, and um, then we're going to talk about when to intervene. We'll talk about the surgical options for intervention, um, and then briefly what to do after failure of intervention, and then there'll be some time for questions at the end. Also watch The Mandalorian if you haven't, it's great. Um, so let's go urethral reflux in brief. Um, first, I'd like to direct you to uh, Dr. Nora Lee and Dr. Christina Chain's lectures. Dr. Lee lectured earlier in this series uh, about vascular urethral reflux. Um, and Dr. Ching, rec um, she lectured in the PD Euro Flow, the lecture series in the afternoons for the fellows about reflux. Um, they both did an excellent job and comprehensive talks and uh, didn't speak about surgical management, um, so they would be a nice, it would be a nice lecture to catch if you hadn't seen it. However, if this is the only uh, vesicoureteral lecture, that vesicoureteral reflux lecture that you're going to watch, um, it's worth talking about it. So what we know is it's the retrograde flow of urine from the bladder um, towards the kidney, and it's a result of ina an inadequate submucosal ureteral tunnel leading to a failure of the ureteral vesicle junction's passive valve mechanism. I really like the picture on the left because it can it, it demonstrates tunnel length and, and why it matters. Um, you can see with C, this is from the New England Journal, um, the weight of urine doesn't enact the passive mechanism um, that allows uh, the ureteral orifice to co-apt. Um, you can see at B, it's possible um, that it could, and then A, um, that's quite a long tunnel and, and likely uh, the passive valve mechanism is intact. Diagnosis, um, extremely briefly, um, it's usually inspired these days by prenatal imaging. Um, we image all moms and any type of hydronephrosis or hydroureter that we see, they usually end up with a urologist uh, and we recommend um, further imaging and they get to VCUG as infants. Um, the other way that we catch these kids is febrile UTI. Uh, I'd like to refer you to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for UTI and uh, workup. Currently, it's um, two to 24 months and two febrile UTIs for VCUG. Um, however, outside the scope of this talk, uh, it is a little more in depth than that. When children are older or younger, um, you don't necessarily have to wait for two febrile UTIs. So usually children are diagnosed with a VCUG. It's the bottom-up approach. It's avoiding cystourethrogram. This can either be done by contrast or with a nuclear radioisotope. It's more often, um, in most centers, I think it's still performed uh, via contrast. And then there's the top-down approach, um, which is you do a DMSA first if you see renal abnormality, scarring, or, or um, you don't see equitable function, you would then proceed to VCUG. The epidemiology of reflux um, is important to know. Uh, incidence in normal children is quite low. However, incidence when a child has had a urinary tract infection is thought to be 30 to 40 percent, and that's a real number. Uh, most commonly, we see it in females at 80 per 86 percent, and we do know that it's heritable. Uh, siblings have a 30-ish percent, uh, and, and if your mother had it, you have a 66% chance of having reflux. This leads to conversations about screening of family members. Um, often if, the ch if a child is older and hasn't had any problems, um, screening isn't suggested. However, with new babies, um, at least maybe discuss getting an ultrasound. It's always worth mentioning that there is such a thing as secondary vesicoureteral reflux. It's, this is also outside the scope of this talk. However, think structural anatomical bladder obstruction like posterior urethral valves. 
So our international grading system uh, was given to us in um, 1985, I believe, by Leibowitz and his colleagues. It was a consensus statement, um, a very quick review, grade one, it doesn't make it to the renal pelvis. Uh, grade two, you still have your fragile, delicate, beautifully artistic renal pelvis. Um, grade three, you're gonna have um, a moderate dilation and very minimal um, blunting. Grade four is you enter a more torturous ureter and you are um, having and seeing more dilation. And then grade five, lots of dilation and you've lost um, the, the, the integrity of um, the fornices and you see um, dilation and you can also see match, massive um, ureteral tortuosity. So why do anything? Um, and aside, this is interesting. This is a an image from the AUA core curriculum of a tri a triplication. Um, I've never seen that. Uh, however, uh, they're rare, but out there. Um, so why do anything? We're going to protect the kidney. Um, the goal of treatment and a lot of urologic diseases is to protect the kidney. It usually starts with active surveillance, um, or also call, in this case, also can be called watchful waiting with or without continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. Those are some of the antibiotics that we use um, in children. It's a small dose once a day. Um, as a resident, new resident on a pediatric service, um, make sure you talk to your attendings or your fellows um, for dosing. Um, people have different dosing and different medicines that they prefer. Uh, also, you should know your antibiotogram um, for your region of the country. Um, also, another part of active surveillance, I think, is aggressive bowel and bladder treatment. Um, this cannot be overstated. Um, you can ha help kids resolve their reflux um, if you can resolve their constipation, if you can give them good voiding habits, uh, like timed voiding, um, double voiding, and, and good use of their pelvic floor. Uh, we have an amazing team here at Rady Children's uh, that does our bowel and bladder dysfunction, and uh, they, are, they are a priceless resource. And finally, um, while we're here today, is we're going to talk about surgical intervention. So I do have a disclaimer. Uh, I was a fellow, I was a Barry Bellman fellow at Children's National Medical Center, and um, my mentors there um, taught me about reflux in that if you give it time, it will like it, a lot of reflux results. Kids can grow out of this. Um, the data that we have is till, until five years of age. Uh, so there's some patience attached with that. Um, and again, I know I said this on the previous slide, but treating bowel and bladder dysfunction aggressively will, will really help you uh, and help kids um, with reflux resolution. So the history of reflux, I enjoy medical history, um, so we're gonna go way back to Galen's experiments and Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. Leonardo da Vinci actually was the first person that postulated the anti-reflux mechanism. Uh, the picture you see on your screen is a picture from the Codus Atlanticus, which is a 12 volume um, bound set of da Vinci's drawings. That there's over 1100, and they run the gamut from rep weaponry um, to botany, uh, to medical uh, diagrams as uh, this is one, this is supposedly, was, uh, or they think it was drawn somewhere between 1515 and 1516. Reflux was discovered in the late 1800s and in 1877, um, Taufer is the first reported ureteral neocystotomy. <clears throat> this is actually reported by Dr. Bovey in 1900. He had a series of 80 ureteral reimplants um, done on uh, at, when there was a, a ureteral transection at the time of ureteral fistula repair. Most of these ureteral fistulas in that time were from prolonged labor, um, but he was the first series report. In 1952, Dr. Hutch um, performed AT reflux surgery on paraplegic patients, and he really paved the way um, for treatment of vesicoureteral reflux. Um, it's worth mentioning in 1959, Dr. Hodson, um, he uh, had, he published that vesicoureteral reflux was more common in kids with urinary tract infection, and he linked this with uh, pyelonephritis and renal scarring. So uh, intravesical repair was described um, by Politano and Ledbetter in 1958. Um, this is a creation of a new hiatus that's superior to the original. 
Um, and also, they established the gold standard of ureteral reimplant surgery in that um, they created a tunnel. And in, in a polytunnel lead better repair, you actually have quite a nice tunnel. Um, so disadvantages of this, and since they they moved the ureter around quite a bit, um, was angulation, kinking, and twisting of the ureter. So therefore, uh, to react to that complication, um, and Glenn Anderson published in 1967 their ureteral advancement technique. And what this is, is you're just advancing the uh, ureteral orifice and the tunnel towards the bladder neck. Obviously, you're limited by the size of your bladder and the, and the distance between that ureteral orifice and the bladder neck. Um, so this isn't a procedure that can be done on everybody, um, but it was seen as a, uh, a, you're eliminating the possibility, or there was less of a possibility of kinking or twisting the ureter with this procedure than had been with Politano and Ledbetter's. In 1975, Dr. Cohen gave us his cross uh, trigonal um, reimplant. Uh, this is the reimplant that I saw the most when I was a resident. Um, you, this is great for small bladders. Um, you can move the ureters um, quite a bit. And as looking at the pictures, I'm sure you immediately see that the um, problem would be is if you ever needed ureteral access later. Um, if patients needed to be stented or um, stone disease in the future, uh, this could be quite the problem with the Cohen cross. So Lick Gregoire in 1961 and 1964 talked about an extra vesicle repair for the first time. Um, this was very popular in Europe and adopted. Um, however, American surgeons were less enthusiastic uh, because of Dr. Hendren's first reports of this repair being unsatisfactory. It seems that um, extra vesicle repair has, has continued to be slow um, to take on because many people that I've met are more comfortable with the intravesical repair and, and that is spoken of as, as the gold standard even to this day. Minimally invasive surgery came to us in 1984 with bulking agents. We've tried to bulk up the ureter and other parts of the GU system with a variety of substances since 1984. Uh, we currently use Deflux. Uh, that was FDA approved in 2001. It's suggested for grades one through four. Uh, there's three techniques uh, that are commonly spoken about for Deflux. Um, first, the sting technique, which you see um, as figure three on your screen. It's a six o'clock injection um, at the, it's subureteric at the ureteral orifice. Um, figure one shows us the hit, which is intraureteric. And then finally, the double hit, um, which addresses both of those. And in a paper, I believe in 2017, that was what 92% of practicing urologists who were doing deflux um, replied that they did. Finally, uh, when, when looking at this slide, um, uh, full disclosure, I do robotic reimplants, um, but a lot of people, this is a very controversial slide, whether a robotic reimplant um, should be performed. Um, Craig Peters described this in 2004. There'll be more on this later. Um, it's described for both intravesically and extravesically. Most people do extravesical, um, although intravesical um, is being done. Um, I would be remiss not to talk about that laparoscopic repair is being done in foreign countries. Um, that don't have access to the ro robot. Uh, we saw beautiful laparoscopic robotic, both intravesical and extravesical repair um, done by a um, practice with, uh, in India at the World Congress of India Urology two years ago. Um, so those who don't have access to the robot are also doing minimally invasive robotic reimplants. So who needs surgical intervention? Um, this is probably one of the things that matters most to residents and, and a thing that you should know. We can look to the AUA core curriculum um, for that, so you can always sit down and review this, but breakthrough UTIs, a, a child was on con uh, continuous antibiotic prophylaxis and they keep having urinary tract infections. Um, renal scarring, and what this means is progressive renal injury. Uh, with my babies, I often get a DMSA early, especially in higher grades of reflux, in higher grades of reflux without febrile UTI, but also I, I will get a DMSA with um, after febrile UTI, usually four to six months after. 
um, so I can document where they are when I meet them. Um, parents who hesitate to go through a surgery, often if you show progressive renal injury, they're more inclined um, to have it repaired. Uh, and another, another reason is failure, or another thing that you can document is failure of renal growth. Um, that can be done by ultrasound. Another hot topic in pediatric urology, ultrasound is often a poor study, but to its credit, it shows us really bad stuff. Um, so we know when we need to investigate further. Um, others who need intervention, um, people who are non-compliant and at-risk populations. Um, if you're afraid you're gonna lose a child and they have high-grade reflux, um, there's many examples of that. And relative, um, persistent high-grade VUR. And these are kids who haven't had breakthrough UTIs and don't have renal scarring, but they keep coming back again and again with grade four and five. Um, pubertal age with nephropathy, parental preference, and um, failure of resolution after watchful waiting. All of these are relative and I think have to be um, made in a, in a shared decision-making model where um, you really manage expectations of the parents and you tell them the risks and benefits and you tell them your worries and your concerns and you come to a consensus on how you're gonna follow this if you're not going to try a definitive repair um, or you know what a definitive repair means for their child. So quick aside, um, if you Google um, ureteral reimplant. Um, Johns Hopkins actually provides you, and you click on images, Johns Hopkins provides you this image, image of um, Dr. Akavan, who is one of my fellowship classmates and, and a really good guy. Um, he, he looks he, bemused, I don't know, you can describe him via a variety of emotions here. Um, but right now he's looking at the tenets of good surgical repair. Um, a quick aside, and this may be obvious to some, maybe not to others, um, anytime you look at the tenets of good surgical repair, uh, you're also looking at the complications that we are trying to avoid. Um, so before you even go to the OR, exclude secondary causes of reflux. Also think about adequate bladder size. You don't want to attempt an intravesical reimplant in a tiny, tiny baby where you're not going to have anywhere to move the ureter. Um, so these are two things that you have to consider. Um, even if you're everybody's signed up and, and ready to go, is there anything else you need to do um, before you can suggest surgery or proceed with surgery? When you're in this, and when you're in surgery, you want a tension-free ureteral anastomosis. So this is a, this looks like a very mobile ureter with adequate blood supply. Um, so you're not stripping the ureter completely. You're also going to try to get a five to one submucosal tunnel. Um, in my experience with attending, some people measure it, some people eyeball it. Um, this is from Dr. Paquin in the 1950s, and he did a bunch of ureteral dissection. And what he found on refluxing ureters was a ratio of 1.4 to 1. And what he found on non-refluxing ureters was 5 to 1. And we have um, continued this um, ever since he discovered this. And it's always in pediatric urology, um, and hopefully all urology actually, uh, gentle handling of tissues, please. Um, less manipulation, don't make things bleed, um, don't have a, a super heavy grip, um, put in hitch stitches to help you. So maybe you're not touching the ureter at all. Um, and, and also as a, um, one of my mentors, Dr. Craig Peters, um, you know, don't, don't muck around with the, with the bladder mucosa um, either if you're gonna do this, if you're gonna do um, a ureteral reimplant. So um, we decided to go to the operating room. Do we do a cystoscopy? Well, it's not mandatory, um, but why would you? Well, one thing is not everyone's compliant with antibiotics. Oh, sure, you know, Jamie's taking her prophylaxis every night. Um, I've definitely been in situations where I have looked inside the bladder at the beginning of the case and I've seen acute cystitis, um, and then you come back another day with treatment if you were going to do an intravescal repair. Um, it also can discover unexpected anomalies. Admittedly, this is becoming more and more rare as our radiology gets better. Um, however, I think most pediatric urologists have gone in with cysto and all of a sudden seen a duplicated system or not gone in with a cystoscopy and, and, and found a duplicated system that wasn't apparent on ultrasound or even um, 
a radionucleotide study. Um, you could also miss a, a small ureteral seal. Um, so there are reasons to do a cystoscopy prior to beginning the procedure. Um, one reason always to do a cystoscopy if you're pre-stenting. Why would you pre-stent? Um, well, if you're going to do an extravesical repair on a solitary kidney, maybe. Um, maybe you're going to use it as a marker to help you find your ureter in an extravesical repair. There's a variety of reasons to stent. These can be externalized. Um, they can pro they can be placed on strings, or they can be internalized, and you can go back later. Um, I try to avoid repeat anesthesia on children. Um, therefore, I usually externalize or put stents on strings, because nobody, no parent really wants their kid to go back under anesthesia. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary if a kid's um, at risk. Another reason for pre-stenting: they have two good kidneys, but or they have two kidneys, but both kidneys have um, problems. They're both extremely scarred. So that would be a decision that you would make um, on a per patient base, basis. basis. Um, one of the pieces of advice they give is leave your bladder somewhat full. I'm not sure that that matters. Uh, usually people put in a catheter on the sterile field and you can fill your bladder um, up and down as much as you want during the procedure. So what surgical intervention do you choose? Uh, you have a bunch of options and um, we're going to talk about that a little bit. So I thought about doing a quiz and then I decided not to because I get frustrated by quizzes that don't have right answers. Um, really with ureteral reflux surgery, um, most kids, most patients, most adults, you probably have more than one option. Um, so in this list, you can see that they all have 15 before month or year. Um, they all have some type of reflux. We're going to assume they all have breakthrough UTIs or scarring. They're all candidates for surgery, um, but really who is the most appropriate? And, and this is a very short, succinct list. There's obviously more factors with most children, um, but I'm just making a point um, that as long as you're making a good decision or you're making a decision that's thoughtful, um, you're probably making the correct decision with management. So open intravesical, um, usually through a fan and seal incision, um, it is the gold standard. Um, it's such the gold standard, um, and it quotes such high rates of um, resolution is from anywhere from 96 to 99 percent um, that people don't get VCGs. So how do they know the 96 to 99 percent? Well, you know, we have all the literature. I would encourage you, if you're a pediatric urology, urologist in the making or a fellow or, or even an, an adult urologist that, that does re-implants to get VCGs for the first couple years of your practice. Um, I'm I've been in practice now five years coming up um, this summer, and I still get VCUGs, um, not always. Um, I'm now more easily talked out of it by parents, um, but a lot of parents do want to know that the reflux is resolved, so I'll get them anyway. But it's nice to have that data where you can actually say, yes, 98% um, of children that I do this procedure on do have resolution of their reflux. Risks of an open intravesical reflux, uh, uh, open intravesical repair, um, obstruction is one, hematuria. Usually these things are transient um, and self-limited. Um, considerations, if you're going to do a Glenn Anderson, do you have enough room? If you're going to do a Cohen Cross, um, is this person going to need future access to the ureters? Do they have stone disease in their family? Because um, they're going to be very difficult to stent postoperatively. Um, if you do have obstruction postoperatively in a colon cross, um, often the, your child is going to get a, nep a nephrostomy tube. That's great because you can shoot an antigrade uh, study and see when it resolves. Not so great because um, nephrostomy tubes are hard to keep in place in super active kids. Um, so the tenets of a good intravesical repair that are in addition to those of all um, ureteral reflux repair is you have to ensure the ureter is straight. Um, that it's not twisted or angulate, uh, has no angulation. Um, one of the, you know, big breath holding moments in any um, intravesical repair for me is I, I have a stent in almost the entire time. Um, after I've made my anastom uh, anastomosis, I remove my stent 
and then I feed it in and it, it needs to go like butter, um, just easy. Um, you don't wanna be snaking it around or jamming it. Um, if it doesn't go easily, uh, you should probably, you, or you should take down your anastomosis and make sure that your ureter is not twisted um, or turned and, and figure out how you can make that stent go um, easily without resistance. <clears throat> Also, you want to make sure that your anastomosis is patent. Um, think about spatulating if you need to. Um, most, most of us eyeball that. Um, huge ureters, we don't spatulate. Also with intravesical repair, um, I'm more likely to do an intravesical repair on a child that I think that may need um, application or excisional tapering. Um, these kids usually get stents. Um, but really pay attention to what the actual orifice looks like and your anathemesis looks like because you're going to have postoperative edema. So intravesical, things to think about. I think the first three are probably great candidates for intravesical repair and you can make a very good argument um, and should, you should present this as an option to the parents. You have a 15 month old male with bilateral grade four and right renal scarring. Um, you know, think about your cross trigonal reimplant. Uh, maybe his bladder is going to be big enough to do an advancement. Um, you have a 15-month-old female with a unilateral right grade three, um, also a, a, a small baby. Talk about intravesical, talk about the fact that it's um, probably upwards of 96 to 99% effective. A uh, 15-month-old male, a unilateral left grade five with a periurethral diverticulum. You could even add like a reuterocil in there. Um, this gives you an option to um, take the ureter away from a part of the bladder that doesn't necessarily have a lot of integrity when we're talking about detrusor and um, you're going to have a better backing, better tunnel. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about open extravesical now. So fan and steel versus inguinal incision. Benefits are no hematuria, um, a decreased chance of postoperative obstruction, um, generally, you don't have stents or superfluid catheters or perivesical drains. Uh, I'm going to make a caveat to that um, in mere seconds. Um, and also, you're going to maintain anatomic integrity. So you're going to have access to these people's ureters after the surgery. Um, with bilateral extravesical, the risk is urinary retention. Um, this is because of violation of the pelvic plexus or swelling or inflammation. This is quoted about 4%. Um, I was made aware recently this was an in-service question last year, and um, it's usually temporary. It usually resolves. Because of this, um, if you were going to go towards an open extravesical reimplant, um, I would consider doing it in toilet trained children, or if the child is not um, toilet trained, then leaving a superpubic catheter so you can check post void residuals. Um, it's, it's a real bummer um, to have to put in a cath or place a catheter in these tiny kids um, for a couple of weeks. But usually by week two, um, we see resolution of urinary retention. So tenets of good extravesical repair, um, all the same as the ones before, you're still gonna mobilize the ureter. Um, the extravesical repair, um, I highlight this because I've been told and that some people don't do this, and, and that is the theory of maybe why extravesical repair hasn't had um, as much success. I mean, we're still talking probably 92 to 96 percent, depending on what studies that you look at, um, but you still want to mobilize the ureter. You still want an attention-free um, tunnel, and you still want to maintain adequate blood supply. You still want um, that five-to-one um, ratio. Um, the uh, addition here is you're going to mobilize the detrusor flaps. And when you do that, and, you, that, and that's going to, you're going to place your ureter in the tunnel. Um, I always put either a jake or a right angle in the tunnel. So when I tie down, I'm not um, strangulating the ureter. Um, but you, you, make, you make detrusor flaps, so you actually have a shelf that you can lay your ureter um, down into. And, and you want to see the mucosa for this. Don't, don't leave detrusor a lot of detrusor in front of your mucosa, or at least that's that's how I was taught. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to mention inguinal extravesical. I really like this surgery. Um, I think it's an excellent option. Um, that's kind of a minimal invasive, minimally invasive alternative. Um, it's described as anywhere from a two to a three and a half centimeter incision. Um, my incision is usually about two and a half centimeters. Um, it looks like you did a, an, um, an orchiopexy or an inguinal hernia repair. Now with this procedure, please consider your body habitus. Um, the chubby kids and the kids with the huge fat pad, um, 
you, you don't want to be in a, in a deep, dark hole. You can extend your incision always, um, but it's nice to have the tiny little incision. Um, and older kids, the oldest child that I've done this on was seven, um, but she was quite thin. Um, and she had, um, she had excellent result. But again, you have to make sure that you have the adequate tunnel length and do all the things that you're supposed to do um, as previously described. So for open extra vesicle, um, the ones that kind of pop out to me is the 15 month old female with a unilateral right grade three. I think she'd be a great one for an inguinal extra vesicle. And then a 15 year old female um, with right grade two and recurrent UTI is another, um, another good consideration for extra vesicle, um, kind of leading on to maybe a more min in minimally invasive approach. So let's talk about deflux. So deflux um, is all over the map with efficacy, um, 70 to 80%, uh, but it's incredibly varied, high volume centers and experts um, upwards of, of 90%. Um, benefits of this is it's outpatient, it's short surgery. Um, all kids feel like that little girl stretching for the sun as she just got out of her TP um, that you see on your screen. This is a picture from the deflux website. Um, she's excited. She just had deflux surgery probably five minutes ago. Um, no, I, I'm I'm hyperbolizing, but but it's true. I mean, they have excellent recovery. They do quite well. Risks of deflux are similar to the risks of all the ureteral surgery. As you have ureteral obstruction, that's usually transient. Um, you have you can have deteriorated hematuria, that's also um, self-limited. Um, you can have failure of therapy, which is a little higher, and that may be meaningful for your parents who just kind of want to be one and done. Um, you can have recurrence. And then there's the question of how long to follow. It's suggested that you definitely repeat a VCG and a renal bladder ultrasound at three months in these children. Um, <clears throat> but then most of us who do deflux do um, subsequent ultrasounds um, for post-op follow-up at six months, maybe at the year, maybe a year from then, um, because there have been reports of scarring after deflux and obstruction after deflux, although um, they're rare. So deflux cases, um, you could think of three of these. Um, I picked all of um, the unilateral. You can certainly do um, bilateral. Um, I don't usually deflux grade four. Uh, that's a, this deflux, as all these surgeries are, it's a conversation between you and the parents and making sure that you guys are, that you're on the same page with what they think um, with their expectations. Um, also, on a side for deflux, um, they found that you know you can do multiple vials of deflux, and some people have had more success with that. Um, so that's worth noting. So finally, um, the robotic ureteral reimplant. Um, sadly, or maybe not so sadly, this is a talk within itself. Um, I kind of wonder who's out there in Zoom land watching. Um, there's definitely people that are vehemently against um, the robotic ureteral reimplant. And there are others that are um, incredibly enthusiastic for it. Um, I'm going to try to prevent, present an unbiased view of the ureteral reimplant. I, I do them for select patients. I, I think it is a good surgery, um, and and I'll explain below. One thing um, that I was taught by Dr. Peters uh, when I was a fellow was don't cut corners just because it's a robotic. You should take that with you any robotic surgery that you're doing. Um, you have excellent vision. Um, you know, you're doing these tiny little micro movements, do the procedure as it's meant to be done. Um, with robotic reimplant, you need to see the mucosa. Um, that might be scary. Uh, you know, you don't want to make a bladder rent with the robot because that just, that messes up your, your vision, your field, and if you're using cautery, um, there's all, you're, you know, all of a sudden evacuating smoke. And um, so I've seen that people don't necessarily show the mucosa. The other thing with a robotic reimplant, you've got to make that detrusor shelf. You've got to make, um, just like the tenants that I talked before about the open extra vesicle, you've got to keep all of those in robotic reimplant. Um, you have three port sites. Um, I also use a hitch stitch. Um, some people use um, like a hitch vessel loop um, that they'll staple. Um, there's a variety of ways to do it, um, but you, you need a camera and two instruments. You can also do the Hyatt's incision um, in older children. Um, that provides excellent cosmesis uh, where nobody can see as long as they're, they're not wearing a super skimpy bikini. Um, I think that it's incredibly beneficial in larger children. Um, and unfortunately in the United States, we're seeing larger and larger children. Um, 
more children are obese, you've got a, a more subcutaneous fat, and it, it's it, the, ro the robot, I think, definitely has um, efficacy for this. Um, the shorter length of stay uh, has been touted. I question this. Most of my kids, regardless of the type of ureteral reimplant, I do leave on hospital day one. Um, I tell parents probably anywhere from 75 to 80 percent of all kids leave hospital day one. Um, Less narcotics, I also question. Um, if you've rotated with me or around me, you know that I don't prescribe narcotics to most children because um, I find that they don't need it. If you schedule um, alternating ibuprofen and Tylenol, um, risks in addition to the open extravascular ureteral reimplant, because that's what I'm talking about here, I don't do intravascular robotic reimplants or uh, port site hernias. Um, I close all of my ports, even though that they're super tiny. Um, you know, kids are smaller, um, and I don't. I've I've seen a port site hernia, and one that wasn't closed. The main critics of um, there are there are critiques. There's one I left off. Um, the critiques of robotic ureteral reimplant um, are cost. Um, I think what we're going to see as we continue to progress and become more attached to minimally evasive surgery and we're doing more and more things minimally evasive, especially with the single port, um, I think hopefully we'll see costs go down and, and it will be equivocal. Also, time is, is a um, critique. Um, these surgeries were longer um, and I, I, think, I think that is an adequate critique. I think as you learn and keep doing these, you obviously get faster and there are those who say that their robotic ureteral implant is about the same, um, or there's no statistically significant difference in um, a robotic ureteral implant. The one that I left off um, is increased complication rate. I can tell you in my practice, uh, and also as a fellow, I, I didn't experience that. Um, but that may be because if you follow the ex you follow the exact um, tenets of the extravascular reimplant, you you should see. Uh, decreased um, or similar um, complications. So for robotic, um, two of them pop out at me. I'm trying to be, uh, this is me trying to stay away a little bit um, from a controversial topic. Um, these older kids, I, I think the robotic um, repair is great in older children. Um, and we could talk for potentially 30 minutes to an hour about what the age cutout, uh, age cutoff is. I'm happy to answer questions about that um, for myself personally. Um, I think that's a personal decision and, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but a unilateral um, in a 15 year old, you're gonna give her a great incision, they're gonna do well. And then the 15 year old male, um, you, you could lower that age. So that could be seven, that could be 10. If their BMI is like 31, I think the robotic repair is something worth considering. Um, Post-operative complications are incredibly rare. Um, we have a good surgery to fix vesicoureteral reflux um, that have minimal complications, so that's great. Um, de novo contralateral reflux is one of the things that's talked about. It usually it self-resolves um, in one to two years. It's usually low grade. Does it matter? Probably not. Um, ureteral obstruction, I already talked about this. Check your tunnel and your anastomosis. Check it once, check it twice. Let everybody in the room put a stent in it if, if that'll make you feel good and, and make sure that it goes easily um, and it's not giving you any resistance. Persistent VUR, that's a huge bummer, um, but most likely and hopefully you've downgraded the reflux quite a bit. And hopefully you've downgraded it to the point where it's not meaningful. Um, one of the things that we're finding as we continue to evolve with our scientific knowledge of vesicoureteral reflux is um, that grade one, um, we pretty much knew um, was likely not a problem and grade two probably is also likely not a problem. Uh, persistent reflux is likely due to insufficient tunnel length at the time of surgery and possibly voiding dysfunction. So with persistent VUR, sign those kids up um, to good toileting hygiene. Um, and if you have a bowel and bladder center near you, um, get them to those people, um, have them see a public, uh, a public floor therapist, um, you have options. Um, so hopefully your persistent VUR is a much downgraded. A new diverticulum, um, most of these aren't meaningful. If they cause the urinary tract infection, you might find yourself back um, for a redo. And finally, urinary retention, which I talked about before, um, usually mostly concerning in the um, bilateral extravascular reimplants. 
So the failure that you have to redo, um, again, you have choices. Um, uh, one of my mentors in med school said, when I first came to California, um, between first and second year of med school um, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, um, prepared me for California. I was coming from the University of North Carolina where I did med school and said, you know, how many nations have chicken soup? And I said, all of them. And he said, yes. And he said, most of it's delicious. Like almost every nation in the world makes a chicken soup. Um, and it's really great. Um, so choices aren't necessarily bad. People doing things differently isn't necessarily bad as long as you end up at the same result. Um, and, and what we're all aiming for is resolution with low complication. So if you have recurrent reflux um, after deflux, some people deflux again. Some people um, do an open intravesical, some people do open extravesical. Uh, you can also do a robotic. Um, I've done robotic repairs after failure of deflux, and you can pull the deflux out at the time. Um, there's a, a publication, there's, there's sparse literature on this. I believe in 2006, um, I think that was from Elmore, and talking about extravesical uh, extra um, reimplant after deflux. If intravesical, you can redo intravesical versus extravesical. Um, if it, I, depending on the type of intravesical, deflux may or may not be an option to you. If extravesical, you can do open intravesical, you can do open extravesical or robotic. Um, and if transplant, um, the suggested is extravesical with a stent. That's also from a 2006 study. Um, Dr. Baskin's group, I believe. Um, I'd like to leave you with two things today before I take questions. Is it's really all about the tunnel. If you walk away with anything from this talk, this is the one thing I want you to walk away from. And Dr. Shortliff in the Journal of Urology in February 2017, I think, said it really well. And <clears throat> her quote is, although mystery still um, envelop best management for vesicoureteral reflux in specific situations, and various techniques for correction and prevention of VUR wax and wane. Submucosal tunneling remains a reliable concept for creating a urinary anti-reflux mechanism. Regardless of whether an intravesical, extravesical, laparoscopic, or robotic procedure is performed, the tubes are ureteral, appendiceal, or bowel. The tunneling is into the bladder or the bowel. Since 1958, the present uh, to the present, the submucosal tunneling technique for preventing vesicle urea flux was, has withstood the test of time. Um, finally, whatever you choose, be comfortable with the procedure. Offer the what things that you are good at, that you are comfortable with, and then choose your indiv intervention individually for each patient. Choose it with the families and, and you know, be very open and honest about what each of those means. Um, talk to them about the risks, talk to them about the possible complications. So if any of these things happen, they're not gonna be surprised and they're gonna know that you were there with them at the beginning and then stay with them because the great part about this surgery is most of the post-op complications we can deal with or resolve on their own. So here's the, the slide. Um, Please tell us what you thought. Um, thank you for tuning in. I think we have some questions. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Paul. Yes, uh, we do have some questions, Dr. Swords. Uh, I'm Paul Campbell. I'm one of the residents rotating here at Radies right now from the Naval Hospital. Uh, the first question that I have is, uh, do you perform cystoscopy in all your reimplantation cases? I don't. Um, I, I have, I usually perform them in um, extravesical um, infants. Um, I don't perform them routinely in my robotic cases. Um, I don't do them in intravesical cases because you're going to open and see the bladder. Um, and usually I don't know that it matters. I would perform one if, like I said, I needed a stent or if I thought if the, if the parent said, you know, your urine smells funny or they've been acting funny, um, that would be a time that if, even if I wasn't prepared to do it, I would add it on. Okay. Um, and then a question about VCGs. How often after reimplantation do you do a VCG? I know you kind of made a comment earlier in your career, you, you advocate for doing it more often, but maybe you can also speak to some of the current guidelines on VCG and imaging post-operative. Um, so uh, VCG is not, um, obligatory um, with the intravescal, intravescal reimplants and even extravescal reimplants and then kind of surveying informally my colleagues, a lot of people don't do them. Um, I tried to convince, I convinced 
I tried to convince most parents to do them in my first three years because I really wanted to know what my outcomes were. Um, I, when I do them, I do them in about three months postoperatively. Um, I usually uh, have kids on antibiotics until then, unless parents are really against it. Um, I, I like to know that it resolved. Um, if parents are incredibly against it, I don't, um, I don't think that it has to be done. If I do deflux, I tell them that they, that if they're signing up for deflux, they are also signing up for VCUG. Okay. Um, the question I have is, do you do extra vesicle repair and high grade reflux? Uh, you know, maybe you can speak, does the grade of reflux actually influence your choice of reimplant approach? It does. Um, and, and I've been told by others that it doesn't, it, it doesn't um, influence theirs as much. And, and maybe that will change as my career continues to evolve. Usually with grade five, especially in infants um, that have an indication, I would do an intravesical repair because that, um, you know, I think that makes it easier for tapering and tailoring. Um, and I think it's more successful and I like that 99% um, quoted rate. I um, I don't, I have done grade four extravesically um, and that's more recently in the last two years with success. Um, I have yet to do grade five extravesical. Uh, so usually I try to talk to, I talk to people about intravesical repair with grade five. Um, the next one I have, uh, for doing your inguinal extravesical approach, do you only do that for unilateral procedures or would you do bilateral inguinal approach or would you prefer a fan and seal if you were going to do extravesical? Uh, for... we, we just, we just did one of these the other day. So I ended up doing a fan and seal. Um, I, I mean, I've never done a bilateral inguinal. Um, I think that, I guess you could, um, I, I the only inguinal approaches I've done are are unilateral, and I think it's I mean it's a really great surgery. Um, once you know your your anatomy, I think there's probably a learning curve of maybe two to five cases. Um, it's quite it's quite expedient as well. Um, but usually, up until this time, I've done fan and seals um, for a bilateral extravesical. Okay. Last question. Um, I think the question is asking, uh, do you ever have any concern about uh, stenting, potentially compromising your repairs in kids that you do place a stent on? I haven't in the past. Um, I, I mean, I guess that's, I guess that's possible. And, um, you know, sometimes if you've got a stent in your way, if you're pre-stenting, um, it might be harder to place it in the tunnel because um, it might it might resist, um, but I haven't seen that. That hasn't been a problem that I've experienced. All right, those are the questions that we have. Well, thank you very much again for tuning in, and thank you to UCSF for, for um, making this wonderful collaborative. Thanks, Paul, for moderating the questions, and um, we're done a little bit early, which I think is always a good thing. Um, have a great rest of your week, everyone, um, and uh, I guess we're all almost all back to work.